Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and dive into, uh, we'll wrap up our CNS work that we uh, left in incomplete uh, at the end of the last session and we'll finish it up. Um, and we wanna talk about is the interventions. What's the currently available status of uh, interventions in the central nervous system? Well, it's limited. There's not a lot we can do because we don't understand uh, the system enough because it's fragile, uh, our tools are, are inadequate. They uh, span things like electroconvulsive therapy to vagus nerve stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and deep brain stimulation. Huge opportunities for bioengineers on all of these fronts. This, uh, you, you know, is commonly known as electroshock therapy. You might have heard about it. It's uh, act actively used at, uh, around the world. Uh, I myself have delivered more than 200 of these treatments. It remains the best treatment for refractory depression, but it is astonishingly uh, crude. Uh, I wish we understood more about how this works. Uh, fact is we don't. Um, but this is what happens. You take a patient, you put uh, an electrode, surface electrode on either temple. Uh, you put them to sleep and you actually paralyze them. You give them a muscle paralytic so their body doesn't move. They can rest peacefully and you give them a seizure. You pass uh, 100 to 500 millicoulombs from one electrode to the other. And there's a huge activation of everything in the brain. Uh, the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, then the sympathetic nervous system. You have a seizure that lasts for about a minute. Everything changes. There's sprouting of connections. There are uh, neurotransmitters that appear in the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, there's elevated metabolism. Everything happens. We don't know which of these is causal in giving rise to the antidepressing, antidepressant effects of electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, every time we try to make it more precise, more limited, more restricted to one part of the brain, it's less effective, okay? So that, unfortunately, is the state of things. Some of the hypotheses, people have thought maybe there's downregulation of neurotransmitter receptors, maybe there's altered blood flow to the frontal lobe. There are some side effects. People are transiently confused, and some people complain of uh, lasting retrograde amnesia. They'll say they can't remember a few months or a year or two of their lives, and that's a, a serious issue. But uh, it's life-saving for many people. You do it three times a week for eight to 12 total treatments. They'll still relapse like any psychiatric uh, treatment. 50 to 80% will relapse within the first uh, six months to a year. You can do what's called continuation ECT. Come, have them come by uh, every week, uh, every month even. You can space it out to every three months uh, to maintenance treatment. And again, we don't understand how any of this works. It's purely empirical. Now, there are more precise things that people have tried. Vagus nerve stimulation is kind of interesting. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. It runs down both sides of your neck. It innervates your gut, your heart, uh, but it also brings afferents back to the brain. Uh, and those report on uh, the homeostasis of the uh, abdomen and, and thorax. And you can put a little cuff around the vagus nerve right here in the neck. So you can kind of access those afferents that are going back to the brain and you implant this little controller uh, under the clavicle, and you can control that with a handheld uh, wand, radio frequency interrogator controller, much like a pacemaker. And I have a few patients in my clinic that I, I use this for, but again, we don't know how it works or why it works. It's actually not that effective, to be honest. What's nice about it is how it does let you access the brain uh, without directly going into the brain, and so you avoid brain surgery by using this, uh, this access route. There's a little surgery site in the neck, uh, it's barely visible, and then a little surgery site uh, uh, under the clavicle. Uh, quantitatively, what does it do? Well, it delivers a, a tiny current to the vagus nerve. You pulse it at 20 to 30 hertz. Uh, you leave it on for 30 seconds, then it's off for five minutes. So there's a duty cycle that's just free running around the clock. Uh, it's mostly off. And you elevate uh, it uh, to about probably between two, to hit about two milliamps uh, or until there are side effects. Well, what are the side effects? They're pretty substantial. This is the kind of thing you can see. Alt voice alteration, that's very prominent. When it's active, the voice sounds like they're being strangled. It's a very raspy, uh, 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 strangled sort of sound. And so you, someone who has public speaking or uh, in conversation is a normal part of their life. It uh, can be very, very, uh, you can have cough, you can have neck pain. Dyspnea is difficulty breathing. Dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Uh, all kinds of other things associated with the spread of the current uh, around the neck. So you're, you've got this uh, current that's being delivered to the vagus nerve, but it's affecting the laryngeal and pharyngeal nerves. And some of those side effects dampen out by uh, nine to 12 months, but some don't. 
Um, but how effective is it? Well, it's pretty small. You've got depression rating scales that people use. Uh, you know, this goes down to zero, but just they blew up the 30 to 45 uh, region. The higher you are in this, the more depressed you are. And, you know, they didn't really do a side-by-side -side comparison. This was the pattern, the reduction in the depression score with Vegas nerve stimulation in this pivotal study, 205 patients. Uh, but their comparison group also went down. Um, it was statistically different, but this is not a huge effect, you know, difference between 40 and 35 on this uh, depression scale. It's plotted to look big, but it's really not that big. And it, clinically, it's, uh, it's sort of unsatisfying to use. Many patients don't get better. All right, this is a more interesting one in that it's got maybe a bigger upside, more flexibility. This is transcranial magnetic stimulation. This uh, is also FDA approved for depression. You put the patient in a chair, you bring in a, a coil that looks like this close up, uh, and you can stare tactically, place it over particular parts of the brain. Uh, still outside the brain, over the skull, and the patient is awake and alert. You can do this in your office. And we've done a number of these at Stanford. <clears throat> it uses uh, induction. Uh, you have current that's in this. There are coils uh, of wire, copper wire, inside this uh, uh, little uh, device that comes close to the brain. And what you do is you uh, pass uh, current through it, and that creates a, a magnetic field. And you pulse the current, so it creates a rapidly changing magnetic field. And that, in turn, will induce an electric current in the brain. A rapidly changing magnetic field will penetrate and will change rapidly as, since you're pulsing it, and that will induce a current in the brain. And so the quantitative parameters are pretty interesting here. You have enormous currents going around the coil, uh, thousands of amps, which is pretty remarkable. Magnetic fields that are generated on the order of Tesla, which is amazing for this uh, small device. And you have a rapidly changing B field, small induced currents. The spatial resolution is on the order of uh, centimeters or so. You can't uh, resolve uh, smaller uh, regions than that. Uh, but it's still been useful. Uh, people have used TMS uh, to stimulate peripheral nerves, first of all, but you can also use it centrally. And you can compare motor output with a peripheral versus a central intervention. And that kind of lets you subtract them and see, well, is the, if the patient has a problem in a signal getting from here to motor output, is it more the distal part, the uh, peripheral part, or is there a central component as well? And so you can measure things like the delay, the threshold, and the amplitude of the peripheral response. Yeah. It's not, actually. I've done it myself. It's actually kind of interesting. You, you feel a little tapping, a uh, sensation of tapping, and that's due to uh, recruitment of the muscle, the scalp muscle. Um, and if you put it over motor cortex, you can get a, a twitch of the contralateral side. If you put it over occipital cortex, you can see uh, uh, sometimes uh, glowing lights, and so that's kind of fun. For depression, we, we, we put it over the frontal part. This is actually kind of interesting, though. So over motor cortex, you get twitches. You put it over the whole frontal part of your brain, which is involved in planning and, and motivation and hope. It's kind of an interesting question to ask, what do you experience when you're doing that? And the answer is nothing. So I've done it to myself. I just, I can't, there's no, uh, upon introspection, there's no subjective sense uh, at all. And yet that's the area that we target for depression. So kind of interesting. Uh, again. We don't know enough to apply this uh, in an intelligent way. We don't know the right pulse pattern. We don't know the right location. We just generally apply it to this area because we think that's involved in motivation and hope. But a huge upside, if we understood uh, much about the brain, we could be much more precise about what we're doing. And you can recruit, even though the, the magnetic field doesn't penetrate uh, uh, as deep as you'd like, it drops off with uh, between a cube and a square law. You actually, of course, everything in the brain is connected. And so you can actually recruit deep by recruiting surface structure. The final interventional technique to highlight is uh, deep brain stimulation. And this is where you just jam an electrode in the brain. So this is brain surgery. It's invasive. Um, but it actually works. It works for Parkinsonism. About half the patients who have Parkinson's, deep brain stimulation to the subthalamic nucleus uh, is very powerful in, in resolving aspects of tremor uh, and uh, bradykinesia, or slow movement. It also works for depression, at least uh, it's thought to. Uh, there was a report in 2005, which was uh, buttressed by follow-up work from Helen Mayberg and colleagues, where they targeted the subgenual cingulate gyrus. It's a, it's a frontal region, but it's a, a slightly deep structure. And they introduced an electrode. And just this is the electrodes. They're 1.2 millimeter in diameter electrodes, and they just 
brought them in bilaterally and just cored everything out on the way down. So it's pretty crude and obviously you're only going to do this for pretty severely depressed patients who are treatment resistant. But they did it. They hit the bilateral uh, structure, the subgenual cingulate, and it was exactly the region they wanted. In the sagittal section, it's this little toward the front. And the patients had uh, pronounced uh, effects. They felt uh, calmer, lighter. They had reduced sensation of emptiness or a void. They felt more connected. They had more planning and uh, motivated activity. And th that helped for more than six months. And this was supported by uh, PET imaging studies. So remember our discussion of uh, PET. Uh, in Helen Mayberg's earlier work, she had found that this subgenual cingulate structure was uh, hyperactive in depression at, at baseline. This is cerebral blood flow as measured by PET, all patients versus normal controls. And the regions that are increased are shown in red. And you can see that in the sagittal versus coronal sections. Increased subgenual cingulate or CG25 activity. And then the patients who uh, responded at three months showed decreased activity there. And that was maintained at six months. So it's an interesting way to correlate uh, a brain imaging with uh, treatment response. Now, it doesn't always uh, work. And some follow-up studies have not been as promising as the first one. But still, it shows the potential. And again, a deeper understanding will be uh, crucial. Um, so that's our sort of central nervous system overflow uh, from last time. I just wanted to give you the state of the art in terms of intervention. Right now. Any questions on that or on central nervous system uh, in general? Yeah, so any, any foreign object inserted into the brain will cause local uh, gliosis, which is a proliferation of the glial cells, and it's effectively a scar. And it's thought that that is why deep brain stimulation stops working after about a year or so. Um, but there are all kinds of tissue responses that might be uh, therapeutic or helpful, too. And we don't know which of those are helpful and which are harmful. 